you see up there on the screen, um, <clears throat> this is going to be more of a didactic sermon. I learned that in Bible college. I learned how to spell it too. Uh, it means teaching message more than anything. Um, I had it on my mind all day yesterday, and uh, when I sat down to start putting the notes together, it just, I don't know, wasn't seeming right for some reason, and I got a little irritated, I guess, frustrated probably is a better word, and I just stopped and I prayed, God, I, I, I don't. I don't know if this is the message, but I don't want to stand up in front of the people and say, I ain't got a message. And uh, so God, it has to come from you because I don't, I don't have it if it doesn't. And uh, I don't know, it just seemed like after I prayed, uh, God uh, made me feel better about it. And uh, I want to share with you some things that uh, God has shown me over the course of the years, from, both from His Word and from my life. Um, and it has to do with knowing for sure what God's will is for your life. Um, there are some things that are obvious. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Number one, God wants to see you in heaven. I'll turn it on when I feel like it. God wants to see you in heaven. That's number one. He wants you to bow before him while you're here on this earth. Confess your sins. God will be faithful and just and he will forgive your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then he'll put a big Bible in your hand and you'll read these things have I written unto you that believe in the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You'll know it even on days when you doubt it. You open up God's word and you read it and you know it. Don't pay attention to that clown that I talked about this week on my podcast. This guy, crazy. I've never, I've never heard such blasphemy. His whole thing was the Bible is the mark of the beast and the Bible is an idol and God wants you to close your Bible and get full of the Holy Ghost and then you'll know what God said. And he had proof for that because he had scripture proof for it. Stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. That guy died a couple of years ago, back in 2021, I believe. And somebody is uh, carrying on his ministry for him. But I told him in Sunday school, imagine, imagine that guy dying he how it happened his wife said that he woke up in the middle of the night and she and woke her up and she said honey what's wrong and he said i don't know and died somebody sent uh wrote a comment and said they thought it was interesting that his last words on earth were i don't know and truly he didn't know probably one of the most important things for you to know in this world it's to know that God left us every word inspired, preserved for us today. Amen. It's not even up for debate. It's not an argument that I have. It's just what I believe. I believe the Bible says it through and through from cover to cover. And that's just, that's just how my faith is. So, number one, you should know that God wants you. It is God's will that you confess your sins. And that Jesus lives in your heart and uh, you are you become a son of God by your second birth. That part is easy. Does uh, another thing. Does God want you to read your Bible? When when this guy he lives in Tennessee or he used to live in Tennessee. Now I think he lives way farther south. You get what I'm saying? Um, he says, don't read the Bible. So in that, he sounds like a Catholic priest who tells everybody, you don't need to read the Bible. I'll read the Bible to you and we'll tell you what it means. You just do what we tell you to do and everything will be okay. That's a lie. That's a lie. And God wants you to open your Bible up and read it. Amen. 
Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God tells us anything, he tells us to study. See, those things are easy. But then we run into situations where we don't know what to do. Because, and I, and I think, I, well, I don't think, I know this, that God did this on purpose. If we knew every detail about the future, how would we live if we knew for sure the day we were going to die? Or maybe the day that the Lord is going to return? We, how would we live? I tell you how most everybody would live. They would live a life of sin until they got close to that day. Then they'd want to straighten everything up. There are some people who live like that right now. They think that they're not going to die at their age. And so they live like the devil, do everything in the world, disobey God. And they just think that when it comes time for their death, God's going to wake them up. God's going to get them at the right time. And if they die at the right time and their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, which is a lie. If their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, then they'll go to heaven. Like that guy that Sister Betty went to his funeral. I'm sure he had it all planned out that because the Lutheran minister told him that his sins were forgiven, that they were in fact forgiven. And uh, uh, Sister Betty, I did a funeral several years ago for a man that came by here. Uh, he needed uh, financial help. He needed a little bit of money. So we helped him and he never forgot that. And I prayed with him. And uh, lo and behold, he come by, I don't know, six or eight, ten months later, something like that. And I remembered him and he said his daughter was in a horrible accident, was over at the hospital in a coma. And wanted to know if I'd go with him and pray for her. I said, I sure will. So we went over there to the uh, hospital there in the ICU and she was, all, she was all laid out there in a coma. And uh, I prayed over her and prayed for her and I prayed for him as well and I witnessed to him I told him I said if you get Jesus in your heart have God forgive you all your sins I'm not promising you that God's going to raise your daughter back up but I'm telling you you need to get your life right with God he promised that he would I never saw him again until his funeral his family members called me and said that he had died and I asked them, I, and they wanted me to do the funeral because I was the only pastor that I guess he knew. And I asked them, I said, how did he die? And they said, well, he was drunk one night and down at DeSoto and went around a curve, wrapped his car around a tree and it killed him instantly. And so I preached his funeral and I preached the gospel at his funeral. I did not preach him into heaven. But I did tell him, I guarantee you something right now. He wants you to know, I don't remember his name. But I said, I guarantee you there's something he wants you to know right now. He wants you to know that eternal life is in Jesus Christ alone. And he died for your sins. And if you'll call upon him, he'll save you and you'll live in heaven forever. If he's in heaven, I didn't say this part. If he's in heaven, he wants you to know that because how beautiful heaven is. If he's in hell, he's screaming for you to know that. So I got done with the funeral. They were going to give him a pauper's burial uh, out at a cemetery I never even knew existed. They had a cardboard casket, made it look nice. And, and, uh, but before we went out to the cemetery, his buddies brought in this cooler of Bud Light cans and filled his coffin with cans of ice cold Bud Light. I was furious. I almost walked out and said, you bury him. But I thought, well, they need to hear the gospel again. And I was thinking on the way out to the cemetery, you know, he could probably use those cans of Bud Light right now, ice cold. The problem is he can't have them. And he'll never have them. And so God wants you to read the Bible, to know about salvation, to know about Him. God wants you to be saved. God wants you uh, in a Bible-believing church. But other than that, there are things in our life that just happen. And uh, we don't know what to do. We don't know uh, the voice of God or we don't know the will of God and so on. It happens. Preachers run into it all the time. 
God, you have to help me out with this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And uh, I've, I've told some people in the past that actually discerning the will of God can be a lot easier than what we make it out to be. And I use this passage of Scripture as an illustration. Turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 9, <clears throat> if you would please. Numbers chapter 9. And I'm going to try to get this message done before the eclipse tomorrow. Because it'll be too dark then to read it. By the way, do y'all like the lights? Is it brighter in here for you? John did that. And we appreciate him. And um, as we get older, it, the world gets darker, doesn't it? Or is that just me? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's everybody. All right. Numbers chapter 9. I've had preachers ask me this question, how, how will I know what to do? I don't, or the mic pray for me, I got a decision to make about my church, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, should I leave here, should I stay, should I do this, should I do that? And I've had preachers that I've talked to about this, and I've actually thought about this quite a bit, and saw really how easy it was to discern what God wants. God understands, number one, that he's, the Bible says that the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. What that means is, is that we live in an earth that is bound by time and gravity. Time means that sometimes we pray and we have to wait for an answer to that prayer, or we have to wait and see what God does, and we don't like to wait. This world, if you've noticed, is getting faster and faster and faster. Internet speeds are getting faster and faster and faster. And whereas back when I was young and I wanted to know information, it took me a while to find it out. Now I just whip my phone out, dial it up, and there it is. And now we're living in the days of artificial intelligence that can give us literally every answer we can ask. So when we pray, we think God ought to answer us that quick, and sometimes he doesn't. If you remember Daniel, when he prayed, what was he waiting, 21 days? And finally, Gabriel came to him and told him, and he said, God sent me the day that you prayed. But the prince, the prince of the people of Persia, the devil, withstood me 21 days, would not let him pass till Michael showed up. And I just guess that Michael's got a bigger sword than the devil does. Amen? He's got the sword of the Word of God. Michael fought on his behalf and then cut him loose. So we have time against us. We have gravity against us, meaning that we get older and we get heavier. Amen? And we fall or we drop things, or we drop things and things break, I guarantee you, if it's in my hand any longer than two minutes, I'll drop it. That's me. That's why I'm not a mechanic, or a carpenter, or any such nonsense. I'm not any, any of those. But God has made us subject to vanity. That means that we're under the rudiments of this world. And we have to live under its laws until Christ calls us and makes us free from that. In heaven, we'll live forever, we'll not age, we'll not fall, and we won't drop our stuff. Amen? So we are made subject to vanity, and we cannot tell what the future is going to bring. I cannot guarantee you that I'll get to finish this message. If I were to make that kind of statement, I would be making it as a guess or just in a, in a, in a prideful error. That's how I would be making it, because I do not know from one minute to the next what is going to happen. And that's what God has made us subject to. And he's made us subject to that so that we will, when we need to know what the future holds, we call upon the name of the Lord. And God said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Do you believe God? Say amen. So... The Israelites are in the wilderness. 
They don't know how to get to the promised land. They don't know where it is. All these, all their lives, all they've known is living in Egypt. That's all they've ever known. Now they're supposed to go to a place and God made sure that they're going to go to the right place at the right time because God himself is going to lead them there. And he's going to do it with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Two distinguishable, um, there's no way that they'll miss the, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. They walk out of their tents every day and that's what they see every single day is God amongst them in their presence. Or God has moved over to the, let's say, the next valley or the next hill and he's waiting there. And what is he waiting on? He's waiting for the Israelites to pack up, put everything in order. Judah goes first. Then the rest of the tribes, Dan is always last. They follow the order that God told them to do. And they walk in the direction of God. And as they get towards God, God then gently moves across the sand, across the wilderness. And there's no mistaking. We're following the pillar of cloud by day. And if it's at night, then we'll follow the pillar of cloud by night. Let's read it in Numbers chapter 9. You pray for my voice. I'm starting to lose it already. Singing that feeling mighty fine got me all worked up. Verse 19. When the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. That means God told them, if I don't move, you don't move. If I move, you move. See how simple that is? It's that simple. And verse 20. And so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents. And according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was, verse 21, when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed. Whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Now, didn't they have it easy? Would you say amen to that? They had it easy. All they had to do was look for the cloud, and when the cloud stayed, they stayed. They went about gathering up manna. They went to where the rock was to get water. They uh, took the manna and probably ground it into a flour and made cakes out of it. May have made other things with it. Maybe some gravy or maybe some fried chicken. I'd like to have fried chicken coated with manna. I bet that would be good. Amen. I had a, there's, we have a follower of our ministry. He runs a coffee shop. Uh, out in Pennsylvania, and uh, really great guy, and I he he sells different flavors of coffee, and I had an idea for him. I said, "Why don't you make some King James coffee?" He said, "How would you like it?" I said, "Tasting like milk and honey." So he made it. He ma I don't know how he did it, but he he fooled around with the right amount of flavorings and everything like that, and sent me a bag of it, King James coffee. Flavored with milk and honey. I think I still got it somewhere around in here. Anyway, but God made it simple for them to know what God would have them to do. He gave them a commandment, told them what to listen to this now, told them what to look for. And then they did, then they did what God told them to do. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this, this lesson. I pray, dear God, that you would help somebody that is really really searching for you, looking for you, needing answers, questions answered. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would just give somebody discernment this morning. Maybe they're in a situation at home or at work or maybe in their church and they need to know what to do and they call unto you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would send them an answer and teach them 
Lord, the lesson that you're going to teach us today, probably one of the most valuable lessons I think I've learned. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us all with this and give us understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, wouldn't it be neat if all you had to do was look for a cloud and God led you every day by a cloud? He led you to work. He led you home. He led you... Uh, with a cloud on what to do when you got home, what to do, how, how to do things in your family and how to, how to, you know, be what you are and so on, how to live a good Christian life. And maybe it'd be good for me if there was a cloud here that would, that would tell me every sermon to preach and give it to me in advance and so on and so on and so on. But I got to rely on the Lord just like you do. If I, if I don't rely on the Lord to give me the messages, then you won't be blessed. I won't be blessed. And I want you to be blessed. I really do. That's where my heart is. My wife can tell you that. That's who I really am. I want my family to be blessed and led by the Lord. I want you all as my friends, my brothers and sisters, to be led by the Lord. All the people that are watching online, all the folks out in Kenya, the good pastors that I've met with, I'd like for them to be led by the Lord. And I don't ever want to be the one to mislead them. And so it falls upon me to call upon the Lord and ask God what to say, ask God what to preach. It would be easy if God sent me down from heaven a lesson plan in the mail, or I can get it from Amazon, but a lesson plan for the whole year and, te and tell me every sermon and every uh, podcast and every Watchman broadcast exactly what to do and what to say. But it's not like that. I have to call upon the Lord, and then I have to do something that... I'm going to share with you today watching the cloud and looking at the cloud is just part of it now look in chapter 9 again verse 22 whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not now, how would you like it if you had been praying for something and, I mean, seriously reaching heaven with your prayers, but God waited a year before He finally sent word or answered that prayer? We don't like that. We'd rather, it bothers us if it was two days, or a month, or a year, if we had to wait. The first book I wrote on Bible numbers, I remember it came on me so fast, I was just writing and writing and writing and writing and putting stuff down on paper and typing this in and looking up verses and looking up things and on and on and on. And I mean, it was just, God just pouring it out fast on me. And I got the first draft of it done. And I was reading over it. And I started crying. I started bawling like a baby. It's in my office. And I said to God, I said, God, why did you show me this? And the answer that I got back was, you asked me to. And it was then that I remembered a prayer that I had, one prayer that I had prayed a year before that. And I was listening to the radio and this guy was, uh, he came out with this book called the, the Torah Code. And it was about equidistant letter sequences in the Old Testament Hebrew, uh, which is way off. But I said, God, if this King James is your word then your signature should be in it somewhere. Would you show it to me? And I prayed that prayer one time and forgot all about it. And a year later, God brought that prayer back to my mind. He said, you asked me to do that. And it took, took God a year, but he finally did it. And he's still doing it. By the way, God's still answering the prayer. That's what I like about God. Is that God just answers prayer and he just keeps answering it. Keeps doing it. Keeps doing it. Keeps doing it. Amen. So they had to wait sometimes a year. They would be in one place for a year, eating manna every day, going, getting water from the rock, uh, whatever it was they could find to do in the wilderness. They were there for a year. It was because God had to wait for a year. 
And probably, it was probably during those times that some of the people, like Korah, <clears throat> or like the people that complained about the, the, uh, the manna that came down from heaven, how they didn't like it anymore, it was probably during those times that the people got restless and they got tired of waiting and they said, you know what? We could at least, if we would have left six months ago, we'd be probably halfway back to Egypt. Why don't we just tell Moses, Moses, we're going to get us a captain. We're going to head back to Egypt. We're not sitting here in this place anymore. I, am, I don't know that for sure, but I imagine that if they were waiting six months, eight months, ten months, a year in the wilderness and not moving... Surely, at some point, some of them would be thinking, maybe most of them would be thinking, surely God is not with us anymore. Surely God intends for us to die here in the wilderness and we could just leave and go back to Egypt. At least we'll be doing something. But if they went to Egypt, the something they were doing would be wrong, wouldn't it? And believe it or not, probably in a lot of of churches you would hear something just like that you would hear preachers tell you uh, if God doesn't move then you move and then God will move maybe God's waiting for you to take the first step maybe God is waiting for you to move maybe God is testing your faith maybe God and it's all maybe 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 I like it better when it's I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, amen. So he said, maybe it's a year. The children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not, but when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. You see that now? Whatever has happened, I'm going to make this statement. Everything that has happened to you in your life was God's plan. Let's, let's examine that statement for a minute. Is God sovereign? Is God all-powerful? Is He all-knowing? Can anyone resist the moving and the calling of God. No. God can even make rocks cry out unto Him if He so wants. Amen? The rocks will obey God's voice. If God wants them to sing praises to Him, the rocks will cry out. The Bible says that. So, in all the things that have happened to you, and I'm, and I'm including in that the mistakes that you've made and the sins that you have committed. If God wanted for you to not do something, you wouldn't have done it. It's that simple. I believe that God is the ruler of everybody and everything in this world. Does that take away from our free will, our ability to choose? Absolutely not. They are both woven together in the scriptures. God has called us, the Bible says, from before the foundation of the world. Does it not say that? Then that means that before that for in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, God already saw your entire life. Did he not? Of course he did. And so God allowed or disallowed blessings and cursings that came by in your life. God brought them. God was the one in charge. There's not anything. Let me ask you this one. When God created Lucifer, did he know what Lucifer was going to become? He wouldn't be much of a God if he didn't. So if he didn't want Lucifer to go to the Garden of Eden, what does God have to do to stop him? Not much. He's God. 
Did God know that by making the woman from the man that she would sin and listen to her lust and her pride? Did God know that? Yes. He knew that before he made her. But did that stop God from making her? No. What about the one third of the angels that fall from heaven in the war with Michael? Did God know that one third of them would fall from heaven, be cast out of heaven? Of course he knew. Did, does that mean that, um, that God made a mistake in making them? No. In fact, there is a spirit mentioned in the Bible. I may take two Sundays to bring this to you. This is a deep, this is a deep thing. It's, but it's actually simple. It's very simple. But I'm trying to settle the case this morning of what God does and what God doesn't do. There was the, if you remember, uh, and I've used this illustration before of King Ahab, who is facing a war the next day, and he wants to know if he's going to live through the war or not. So he asks his 400 prophets to tell him what he wants to hear. Ahab doesn't want to hear the truth anyway. And God has appointed Ahab to die the next day. Has he not? So Micaiah comes along and says, let me tell you, let me tell you what I saw. I saw in heaven the heavenly hosts surrounding God. And God asked the question, who can I send to uh, deceive Ahab into going to war tomorrow? One spirit said this, one spirit that, that said that, one spirit stood up and said, I can do it. And the Lord said, how? And that spirit said, I will go and being a lie and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets and will convince him to go. And God said, go, you got the job. Now that was a lying, evil spirit. And yet, it did the will of God. It did the will of God. God had promised because Ahab and Jezebel had Naboth killed and hung in a certain spot. And God said, the dogs are going to lick up Ahab's blood in the same spot that you killed Naboth. Is that not what God said? So that when Ahab comes back from the battle, he's wounded and bleeding all over the place in his chariot. And finally he slumped over and dies. And they take Ahab out of the chariot. A fellow comes along, just random fellow comes along with water and he starts cleaning out the chariot, washing the blood down onto the ground in the exact same spot that Naboth was killed. And when the chariot was moved, lo and behold, what happened? The dogs came and licked up the blood of Ahab in that exact spot. Who was in charge of every bit of that? God was. God didn't leave it up to the dogs. God didn't leave it up to who was going to do what with the chariot. If I remember right, Somebody, if I remember the story right, you, you tell me if I'm wrong. Somebody took a spear or an arrow and just shot it up in the air. And the arrow went and sank right in Ahab. Is that how it happened? I'm pretty sure that's how, what it says, how it happened. So who directed the bow to sink into Ahab's body? God did. Who caused it to come back to this one spot? God did. Who brought the dogs over? God did. God did all of that. And God sent the spirit, the lying evil spirit, the day before to convince Ahab to go to war the next day. How would you like to play chess against God? If it's possible to lose a game of chess in one move, you lost. Because God knows. God already knows the outcome of it. And see, we're building an artificial intelligence system that is nearing the level of a God. That ought to scare us. All right? Now, let me read this again. Verse 23. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. 
You see what I see in here? If they moved, it's because God told them to move. If they stayed, it's because God told them to stay. And it's that simple. So what is the one thing that Israel is being told to do? The word hasn't shown up in the verses yet. But according to what we've read so far, when it comes to knowing God's will on where to go and when to go, what is the one thing that the Israelites just very simply have to do? Huh? Wait. Wait. Now, turn to Acts. And we're covering this uh what on sunday afternoon no wednesday night we're in the book of acts and we're in acts chapter one turn there these are the last words that jesus spoke on the earth and i want you to see what what he does and what he says Now, I don't, you know what, I, I'm going to do something. I don't ever do this on a Sunday morning. But maybe this is something that you've not considered. Maybe it's something that you're not sure of. And you have a right to be that way. Don't take my word for it. Uh, but if you have a question about anything I've said so far, or anything that I say, uh, just simply raise your hand and I'll do my best to answer it. Because I want you to understand this. I think it's important that we understand just how God, God is. How much of a God is God? Are there other gods? Yes. Little g, gods, they're all throughout the Bible. They're devils. And yet, is not our God above all the gods? Is not our King above all kings and our Lord above all lords? So can any of Satan's henchmen, his devils, can any of them get away with doing anything that God absolutely will not let them do? The, the man that was called Legion, because he was full of devils, those devils did not tell Jesus what they were going to do. They asked Jesus for him to do a certain thing. And that is, don't cast us into the pit. Send us over into this swine. They asked, and Jesus let them do it. But Jesus knew what the hogs would do afterward, didn't he? I'd see him sitting there laughing, going, <laughs> Watch this, Peter. Watch them hogs. Down into the sea. They ended up in the deep anyway, amen. I may not have that completely right, but anyway, you get the idea. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, commanded... This is Jesus with his disciples and apostles. Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but... And in your red letter Bible, the first word there is what? Wait. Wait. I had a friend. He's still friends. His salvation experience was in a united Pentecostal church. They are about as close to a cult as you can get. They deny the Godhead, the Trinity. They deny it. Um, they believe in a works salvation in that if you, you must speak in tongues in order to be truly saved. And so this friend of mine, uh, I don't know how he was led to go to this church, but he did and he heard the sermon and he went down to the altar 
And they showed him the gospel of salvation. And he asked Jesus into his heart, asked Christ to forgive, me, forgive him of all of his sins. And at the end of that situation, they all praised the Lord and shouted and danced and everything that they do there. And then they said, now you need to be full of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to lead you into that. And you need to speak in tongues. So, were they content with letting him wait on the Lord to bring it? No. They stood him up right there, told him to raise his hands up in the air, and told him to say hallelujah. So he did it. And they said, say it again. So he said it again. And they said, now say it faster. Repeat it over and over. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hananana, shana, todoya, todoya, by a Hyundai. Okay? And before you know, this Babel tongue came out of him and they said, Woo! He's God and amen! Praise the Lord! He didn't no more have that than Adam had a race car. Jesus told him to wait for the promise of the Father. He didn't tell him to do anything else. He didn't tell him to run around in circles. And I've, I've, I've not seen it, but I've heard, well, I have seen it. I've seen videos of it. I've, I used to pastor out Rich Woods down in that area down in, in Washington County. There's a Pentecostal church in every holler down in there. And some of them are wacky. One of my deacons told me one time he pulled up to the church. They were having revival. And he said, there was a bunch of the people from that church outside running around the church building. And he said, I'm not kidding you. It, it sounds like a setup for a joke. But he's like, what are they doing? And he asked somebody afterward and they said, well, we're bringing in the Holy Ghost. Silly. But it's false. You don't bring in the Holy Ghost with works. Paul said it's a gift. Paul said... Received ye the Spirit by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law? I got that backwards. By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you receive the Holy Spirit, John? Hearing of faith. Gary, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? By the hearing of faith. You don't do works to get the Holy Ghost. You trust Jesus and He gives it to you. It is a gift. Amen? A gift is not earned. And it's not merited. I don't know if they were going to, I don't know if the Holy Ghost was going to go to the first five people that won the race around the church. I don't know. But it's not done that way. Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father. And you could take that one sentence and apply it to every issue in your life. Wait for the promise of the Father. Which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now they're asking for an answer to a long-awaited prayer. The people of Israel have been praying ever since the days of David and Josiah their king. They have been praying that God would restore their kingdom on this earth and establish the Messiah as their king. And so these men are Jews and they're asking Jesus this question, will you now restore the kingdom to this, to this earth? And Jesus said, verse 7, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Underline that in your Bible. Who told you you had a right to know when God was going to do something? You don't. You don't. And I see these clowns on the internet making all these predictions, prophesying about what God's going to do because of this eclipse tomorrow, and it's insane to me. They'll make these claims as if they have some secret knowledge that God has given them that 
God hasn't given anybody else. And if you want to get that knowledge, you must get it from these as such and such preacher. And I've always told my people, you have as much right to know what this Bible says as I do. Amen. You know this Bible, which means you know God. You know this Bible, which me means you pretty much know the answer God's going to give. I've had, I've had a guy that I used to work with. He, he was married, and then he went out and started cheating on his wife with a woman in their church, piano player. And he said, I just feel really close to this woman. I think we're soulmates. And he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, I think God really wanted me to marry this woman and not the woman I married. He already had like three kids. And I said, you're wrong about that, bud. You married this woman. You fathered children by her. Now you accept it. You made a promise, an oath, a covenant in front of witnesses that you would be true to her until the day you died or the day she died. So don't give me this stuff about how you're soulmates with the piano player. I ain't buying it. And God, ain't, and God won't be fooled either and he won't be mocked. He didn't like my answer. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Don't listen to anybody try to tell you when the rapture is going to happen. Don't listen to anybody tell you uh, when, when the, the seals are going to be opened. Or, when, uh, or some people are saying now that the, I believe we're in the sixth seal. Oh, we're in the sixth seal. Oh, no, we're in the fifth trumpet. Oh, the trumpet's already sounding. And I'm going, you guys are lying. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, I want to roll through some scriptures for you. And you're going to find out that God wants you to learn patience. In fact... I'm going to go off, I'm going to go off script here. Uh-oh. He's making the sermon longer. Turn to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Chapter 1. If I can find it. Maybe, maybe it's Second Peter. Yeah, Second Peter. I, that's what I meant. You should have turned there. <clears throat> Look at verse 4 of Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Whereby, <clears throat> excuse me. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue. And to your virtue knowledge. And to knowledge Temperance. And what does temperance bring? Patience. You know what temperance means? That means you've been tried in the fire and strengthened. That's what tempering does. And once you are stronger, you can be more patient. And to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness and to brother brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ if you ask god and say god i would like to know more about you i would like to know more about your word i would like to have some questions that i have in my mind answered God, will you answer these questions for me? God says, I'll do it, but I'm going to start with 
faith and then virtue and then give you knowledge and then give you temperance and then give you patience and then give you godliness and then give you brotherly kindness, then give you charity and then you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful. Turn to Psalm chapter 1, seeing that we are speaking about bearing fruit. Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> By the way, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Once again, the Bible makes it clear that these are gifts and they're not works. Love, joy, uh, patience, temperance, goodness. I can't remember all of them. Certainly can't get them in order. But those things are gifts given to us by God so that we can perform His will. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. Verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit when? God has seasons He works in. Did you know that? I mean, surely... No one's out picking apples off their apple tree right now, are they? No one's pulling tomatoes off the vines. No one's cutting okra. No one's out shelling beans. Because the gardens haven't even been planted yet. Too cold. So when does the fruit come in his season? When does God's blessing come, or when does God's answer come in his season? And that's something that once God settled that in my heart, I became a lot more confident in the ministry that God has given me. I used to just fret and worry and everything else about, am I doing right in the church? Am I doing a good enough job? Am I, am I preaching the right things? And I, I would. I, I'd just make myself sick over it. And God said, Mike, I do things in seasons. And when I get ready to do something in your life, it'll be the season that I choose to do it. And I learned, maybe I'll just wait on the Lord. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, this is what I have on the screen. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Did you see that? So, that means that everything that you've done for the kingdom of God, as God's servant, God... It wasn't you that did it. It was God working it through you. That way, you don't get the applause. God gets the applause. And look at this. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. How do we know love or hatred? We learn it by God. We learn it from His Word. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Why won't He tell us the day? Somebody answer that for me. Why will not God tell us the day of the rapture? Yes, Miss Pam. That's exactly right. That's what I believe. If we knew the day and the hour of Christ appearing in the air, I guarantee you we'd be out sloshing around in whiskey, taking drugs, sleeping around who we wanted to sleep around with, cussing like sailors, living like the devil, until maybe, I don't know, two, maybe two days, two days before the Lord comes, they would get it all straightened out. That's what, that's what Mardi Gras is. Right? Mardi Gras is go out and live like the devil all day and all night long because tomorrow you got to give it all up. Stupidest thing. That church is wicked. Tell people that. But that's true. Pam, you got it right. We would. If we knew the date of our death, most people would chance it and wait 
And by then, probably, they would be in the, so much bondage of sin that they wouldn't be able to live for the Lord. Not even a day. That's why he said that. Psalm 6, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Raise your hand if that's you. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? You know, that's a question that is asked at the sounding, or no, the opening of, I believe it's the fifth seal. In the opening of the fifth seal, verse, uh, Revelation 6, 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You see, they were slain for the word of God and the testimony they held, and they are calling unto God. Their souls are crying out unto God. God, how long? How long are you going to wait until you avenge the blood that we shed for your kingdom? God, how long will you wait? And I want you to notice, no answer is given. Not even here in Psalm 6, no answer is given. It is up to the Father to know these things, and it is up for us to to trust him. Let me read some Psalms to you and now I'm going to cut you loose. Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Psalm 25, 21. Let in t There's a verse I'm, I'm, I'm working up to and I can't wait to get to it. Psalm 25, 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You don't see in the Bible where God says, you go first, and then I'll know what, that, that you really want it. No, they, God says, wait for me to go first, then I'll know if you really want it or not. Amen? You wait on me. And if you can wait on me, then I'll lead you into righteousness. I'll lead you into heaven if you'll wait on me. Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Psalm 37, 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Amen. I want Alaska. Give me the Yukon. Amen. Psalm 37, 34, all same chapter. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. God tells you anything in this book. He tells you to wait on him. Amen. Psalm 69, let not them that wait on thee. Oh, it's, it's coming up. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of God, Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. What did Jesus say? Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. It's just a question of how long are you willing to knock? How many times are you willing to ask? How many, um, how, how, how many, how long is your journey of seeking? And then I, I'm going I'm to close it with this verse. Turn your Bible, Psalm 123. I want to underline this. This is a good verse. <clears throat> let's say that, let's say that I'm the king of Bethel Church. Let's say that. And you all are my servants. 
and you all have to do what I tell you to do. And you're all my servants, and I'm the king, which means you don't get to do what you want to do. Right? It's that way if you're the manager of McDonald's. If you're the manager of McDonald's, the people who work under you, they don't get, they don't get to do whatever they want to do when they work at McDonald's. The manager has been trained, has been doing that job for years. And the people that are under you, they have to wait for you to tell them what to do and how to do it. And if they just go about doing whatever they want to do, that McDonald's is in a mess. I've seen a McDonald's like that. I, I won't say when or where, but I've seen a McDonald's like that. It was a total mess. So I'm the king of the church, and you're my servants, and you're waiting on me to tell you what to do. And you've learned by experience that when I move my hand a certain way and I point to a certain servant, then I want that servant to do what my hand is indicated for that. Look, look at that verse, Psalm 123, 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress. Have you ever heard of ladies in waiting? You know what that is? That's the women who dressed Queen Elizabeth. She didn't put her own clothes on. She was dressed. She had ladies in waiting. And she got up when she wanted to get up. She's queen. And she wore what she wanted to wear. She's queen. And those servants who waited on her were her ladies in waiting. And when she was ready to get dressed, she would indicate it somehow, and they would come and they would dress her. And that's what it says right here. Uh, at the eyes of a maiden, under the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. You ask God for forgiveness, and I'm going to say this. Sometimes I think God might make you wait a little bit for you to get a little bit more guilt in you over it. We don't want to just have a situation where we can just sin and say, God, forgive me for that and move on to the next sin, do we? Is that what we want? Is that how God is? No. God brings the guilt through the Holy Ghost down upon us. He chastens us be times, the Bible says. That means he does it early, he does it quick. He works in us guilt and godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. So God, you may ask God for forgiveness. God said, I'm not ready yet. It's like me, I, hi mom, I love you, but when I would get in trouble as a kid, and I knew I was in trouble, I was automatically saying, mom, I'm sorry, mom, I'm sorry, I really am sorry, mom, I'm sorry. And she would say, not yet. Go lay across your bed, give me your belt. And she would put stripes on my backside. Make me crawl on that bed on my belly. Ah! Now you're sorry. Turn around and walk off. Did I want another dose of that? No, I didn't want another dose of that. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. If God tells you anything in this book, he tells you to wait, 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 wait. And then he'll move and you'll know it. You'll know it. And you'll say, okay, it's time for me to go. I got a lot more to say on this. I'm, I'm done. Let's stand to our feet.